Before we head off into uh, swapping roles into the FI practice, I thought we'd just open up for any comments or questions that you might have. Could you pass one of the, uh, take one and pass it on, please? Yeah. So anything that come, came up from uh, those of you who were practicing yesterday and those of you who were um, volunteering your, yourself? <laughs> Oh yeah, it's my girlfriend. <laughs> there was one practitioner who um, attended the first week of the of the Sydney uh, segment, and uh, she wanted the materials. So thank you for. I totally forgot. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Um, it might be a little bit of a long story, but doesn't I'll matter. It. Just say. <laughs> The last segment, segment that we did, and we did the bell hand quite a, fit, quite a lot, mm -hmm. um, probably a week and a half or two weeks ago, something landed with that oh. <laughs> in my brain. Oh, you see, now that makes me want to ask you a question, but that, yep. you go. Oh, okay. okay. So I, um, I played around a fair bit with the, with the bell hand. Is that imagine you came closer. Now you know how we feel when you You talk. and he, she's short, <laughs> <and> he's <just laughs> tall. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I was trying to keep that in mind yesterday because what came out of the bell hand for me uh -huh. was that my fingers when I was doing it were starting here uh -huh. and I finally realized that my fingers start here <laughs> ah, <laughs> so to do the bell okay, hand from nice. there was quite like, it's way different anyway so I was trying to keep that in mind yesterday with my hand placement um, and just finding out little things. Well, I know already that I use my fingers a lot more than my heels of my palm. Um, so trying to keep that evenly on any surface is quite challenging. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it'll get there. Um, I don't know where else I was going with that. I think you. I think that was really nice what you just said. That'll do then. Uh, it's challenging, but I'll get there. That's that's nice. I like it. Yeah. And I was on the receiving end of that. Um, <laughs> you were a donator? Well, okay. no, I actually feel like I was the receiver. Oh, good. And that's what I wanted to say, was that in experiencing the two differences, because she started off doing it with the fingers, and there was no connection between uh -huh. us. And then when she shifted, the connection was so complete. Uh -huh. And that was a wonderful thing to experience from my end. Beautiful. That's It's getting better. Yeah. So. It's getting better, yeah. Oh. Now, you know what's really nice? There was no instruction in that. No one told you to do it, yeah? You, you found that from a continuity of your practice, something that you carried over from the last segment to this segment. Uh, yeah, yeah, sometimes it does. You know, it's beautiful when it happens in an instant. You get this flash of light on the road to Damascus. But very often... <laughs> I see the light. For those of you who knows the Blues Brothers movie, you know, there's that moment that he sees the light. Yeah. Um, and I was probably really so excited about finding that that I did want to share that so other people, I don't know if anyone else was this, trolling. With no, it. but that's important that you share, that we share this because it's out of the sharing that we have other realizations for yeah. ourselves. So that's great. Thank um, you. But just practicing with these two, they're both the opposite. So, Raymond seems to use his palm a lot more and lifts the fingers, whereas Ange lifts her palm. So, yeah, to, I don't know, it's nice to share that with those guys mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. be able to find that happy medium that it'll Beautiful. be the same. Not easy, yeah. but. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm going to make a little bit of a metaphor, mm -hmm. and please treat it as a metaphor. It's not necessarily the case, but you know, in the nervous system, um, Synapse meets synapse, and that's the basis of connectivity, right? You've got, you've got the axon coming down, and then it reaches the bud at the end. Now, the bud is where the, the neurotransmitters are, are you know, exposed. And then you've got another synapse here, and there's called what they call the synaptic cleft. There's a little bit of a gap between the two. 
Yeah. So you can think when you're, when you're in, I'm going to use this word, when you're interfacing with somebody, you can think of yourself synapse to synapse. And, and there's something about, well, you don't exude neurotransmitters, but you certainly exude intentions. Yeah. And this is what the other person senses and then makes sense of. Yeah. You exude intentions from this end of and and then uh, they're the other side of the synapse because sometimes it's synapse to synapse sometimes it's synapse to uh, axon sometimes it's synapse to body of neuron so you know these places that nervous nervous systems attach they're not just synapse to synapse it's a whole multiplicity of different places so um so yeah, how you're using your hands in a way that clearly conveys your intention. And if that's the case, then the person who you're connecting with, it's a totally different feel, totally different. Hence your report. <laughs> <laughs> because the other thing we did talk about was intention. Yeah. And when the intention is clear, I got it absolutely. Yeah, beautiful. You know, and I, I, the movement went, because sometimes the movement was in a different direction, but when the intention was clear, it mm. was in the direction that mm. was being aimed at. Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? What else? Uh, I had a similar thing, um, and just noticing how, you know, which shoulder issues the transferring force or intention into the person being having to do a lot less i guess uh -huh. or um yeah find different ways of orientating or gripping or mm, it's just stuff to experiment with and a lot of the time i was just going all right just put the other hand on top okay that was nice yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so the, that that the hand the hand on top was the force producing hand yeah yeah uh -huh. so i could get more of a grip yeah. Or, yeah 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 nice so there's another thing right so you start to experiment with things, things that I don't suggest. Well, something else that was really interesting was playing with the, the timing because, you know, we're doing it very slow and then to actually do some rocking. Um, <coughs> when I was working on Anna, her shoulder had a lot more, a lot more freedom. Even when I moved the hip a little bit, the shoulder would just go even further. Mm -hmm. So it was interesting to play with um, timing and, you know, allowing her shoulder to move but at a slower pace than her hip. Or, uh, mm. Great. Once we sped it up a little bit and changed the time, it all, <laughs> yeah. she got like a bit like confused, but it was really interesting confusion for her. Uh huh. Mm. Interesting for whom? For her. Okay. It, she said it was it was confusing, but really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's nice. Because that's it was nice. unfamiliar. Yeah, yeah. Now the the um, the task constraints, the simplicity of the task is what's important because then you can play with a certain set of variables. Yeah. But um, if, if you uh, ignore the task constraints and start to do whatever, what not, you know, not the pelvis, not the shoulder, not the head and start to fiddle with the spine and fiddle with the neck and fiddle with the abdomen, um, it's just too many variables. So I limit the variables so that you can get to play with the variables that are available and discover things within that parameter. Now, like um, that's exactly like an awareness through movement lesson. No different. Yeah. If you try to put in too many variables in an awareness through movement lesson, it just gets confusing. Or other than confusing, it becomes so crystal clear that there's nothing for the person to solve. It's, it's not a puzzle. The meaning is right there, delivered right to their doorstep. It's meaningful. So they don't have to do the, you know, when you're reading a novel and it's a detective mystery novel, you're going, who done it? Who done this? It was the butler. No, it wasn't the butler. It was the maid. No, it wasn't the maid. Yeah. So you... If, um, if an ATM can have that little bit of a flavor that you're just giving enough but not too much, then who becomes the constructor of meaning? 
the person does. And when you and I construct the meaning, sorry for this, it's far more meaningful. It lands in a very different way than just instruction. Now, for different people, you're going to have, you can have bigger gaps, and for other people, you'll have to have tiny little gaps that they make meaningful links with. Yeah. And uh, that's your craft. That's the craft that you're learning. Okay. Yeah. So that's why it was constructed the way it was constructed. Yeah, I really appreciated having the, the time, particularly with the hip, to just you know, try my left hand, try my right hand, um, try different pressures, different angles, you know, mm -hmm. whether my arm should line up with the leg or should it line up with the hip joint or should yeah. it line up with, you know, like all those little things and just, you know, even just really subtle little changes of, you know, which finger is, mm -hmm. you know, do it. In the, in the crease or in the wherever, Beautiful. You know, lower down, higher up, that kind of thing, was just really amazing just to have, have the time and the concentration attention to actually explore mm. all those things and mm. find out what felt most yeah. comfortable for me and seemed to have the better effect. And yeah, Great. I really appreciated that. Because there's lots of variations within that. So, you know, if... Um And you've got to remember, um, Feldenkrais was a short little dude, right? You'll see him later on this week. Um, Feldenkrais and another student in the Amherst training, and the other student is Stephen Rosenholtz, and he's about my height, and Feldenkrais is standing next to him, and he's about there. <laughs> so you've got to remember, um, Feldenkrais was a short little dude, hence short little tables. If we're going to talk about environment, he constructed the height of the tables. That suited him quite nicely. But to follow up on your what you're saying, it's like if if this is if this is the place that I'm forming to, you know, see the nature of the form there. You've done this lesson, right? Where you've formed your hands like that, and you formed your hands like that. Well, there's a difference between forming your hand like that and forming your hand like that. If it's like that, can you see your wrist has to change shape? Your wrist has to change. Oh. If you go around the corner, then of course if I come back, you see I can come back a lot further. So even how far around you place your hand, whether, whether you, you, you um, hook or whether you conform, whether you're at right angles, so if you think of the length of this, whether I'm at right angles to it, or whether I'm on, a on, on, a, on an angle to it, it all makes a difference. And if you've got a fairly regular scenario, then you can make variations and make distinctions about what makes a difference. But if you start varying the scenario, you can't make that inquiry. Yeah. Oh, there's also, I mean, there's also the fact that will I choose to, will I choose to uh, interact level? Will I choose to interact below level? Will I choose to interact above? Because there was, I don't think, I didn't mean to set up a constraint of sitting. Maybe that was implied. But today, know that it's not a constraint. Okay. Adding on to that, because Linda's in my experience, Linda did much the same as Gloria. But what really struck me being on the receiving end was I could really feel the difference between when she used her left hand to her right hand. Uh -huh. And this because I know that I have a difference between the left and the right as well. But then when she got into the rhythm with the left hand, it became so smooth okay. and natural, which was a really interesting thing to observe from my mm -hmm. point of view. So she found her way into how to use the her other. left hand. Yeah, yeah. nice. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, may I ask, what was the difference that you felt? 
the right hand was just so natural feeling uh-huh. and had a flow and a rhythm. Right. The left hand, it wasn't jerky, but it wasn't smooth. Right. Yeah. Okay. And the pressure was different. Right. Yeah. And you shared that at the end. Yes. yes. Fantastic. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Something else? Kevin's not here. Oh, that's a shame. Yeah, yeah which is, um, but uh, we were talking about the height differences and the height difference for Kevin at the table as opposed to the chair height and yeah. the size of the person that you have. So obviously the way in which you move yourself is determined on the biomechanics between the two yes. people. And and the height of the table and where the center of gravity is for that person. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because we thought we uh, we discussed whether or not we should put the table up higher. For yeah. Kevin. Yep. I think um, watching some of you work at the table yesterday. Um, please know that this is an assumed environment here. Also know that Feldenkrais had two different heights of table. Yeah, one that was he could work at a standing height or sitting on a high stool, and one he could work here. So already you can see that there isn't a consistent environment in the room. The environment was to suit him and also sometimes suit the client. Now, you know if you're if you want to, if you don't have a lot of leg spread, you know, and um, the person, and you don't have long arms, <laughs> and the person is there, eh, it's a pretty hard call. But look, if look what happens to my capacity to be close. If this is the table edge, right? Yeah. As soon as I stand up, well, do I want to be this close? Can you see? I can now vary my distance and then do exactly what you did in your ATM. Which was what? Oh, move back from my hip joints. Or I move back. From, you know. Everything becomes available to you, and you've got great variability between you and the table. So this is what, you know, this is what's nice about having a choice. I'm not sure. I know they have the wooden trestle tables like those over there, that are higher, and they'd be solid enough to lie on. If you put a mat over the top, uh, if we can dig some of those up sometime, uh, that I think they're in the back room actually, um, it might be worthwhile trying out what it's like to, um, to work hands-on when you're doing anything hands-on at a higher table and see what changes, and especially for Kevin, right? He'd probably, you know, my, my well, it, also, it also applies for the, the shorter person. Because um, sometimes just having it that much higher means that you're not, I mean, mm, you're you not, can't get over the, t- mm. you can't get over them. Yep. Really. Yep. Yep. That's where floor so, works. So I suppose the question was then, uh, one would just, we decided that the table and the chair has to be for our benefit and that yeah. sometimes it's not, the, you adapt the environment for the person if yep. they can't yep. 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 So you already have that heuristic, yes? The heuristic of the pelvis uh, must be free to move, yes? And I know that if I want to get close to the table and I have my legs really wide apart and my knees are abutting the table, um, there is no pelvic movement. I've, why? Because now this is a triangle and I'm constrained. I'm literally constrained. Uh, yeah, I might have a bit of this, but I certainly don't have that. Well, you can say, oh, well, I can use the systemic relationship with the table to then uh, push that knee. Yeah, I could do that if it's minimal. Yeah, I could go push, push. Yeah, I can do that. 
and that button. You can see what happens with my hands, right? Yeah, that's possible. But then uh, this becomes an environment to deal with. Yeah, I was experimenting with that as well, with which sit bone takes the weight, which foot takes the weight, mm -hmm. and, and which one which one moves. Yeah. And um, trying it one way, trying it the other way, and just sort of seeing. Um, and it almost felt like if, if I sort of did, did the sit bone as the axis of which I was turning around, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. that seemed to actually make things easier. Right. So I, I, you know, have the f a free one and an axis one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great, yeah. great. So you could actually shift and uh, pull back. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to have just one axis. You can have three different axes. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. So here's here's an interesting relationship between. ATM and FI, and it's got nothing to do with the design of the lesson that you're delivering. It's the what you choose to do with yourself and how you do it. Um, and basically, that's how you develop your skill. You take all those sensibilities that you've acquired in doing awareness through movement, and you begin to apply those sensibilities to yourself in the act of doing an FI, whether that be hands-on or otherwise. Yeah. That's an immediate carryover. Now, yesterday, I used that structure because it's a, it's a fundamental structure of a design of a lesson that deals with uh, this capacity that you know, everybody needs, by the way. Yeah, you can't go wrong with that lesson. Not really, because we're all human beings and we all need this rotational capacity. So um, that was me making sense of the quip that we were often given in our training. Um, if you don't know what to do, roll them. <laughs> well, that wasn't good enough. I had to go, well, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> Well, you can see that from a, from a functional point of view of a, of a human being standing upright in the field of gravity, roll them means, not that I have to do that, but roll them means being able to move around one's own axis. Yeah. So when in doubt, turn them around their axis, explore that. And there's, um, today we'll look at different ways that that can be done. Okay? There's not, you know that there's multiple lessons exploring the same thing. Okay. Something else before we um, switch roles? I just wondered out of all your experience yesterday, if you have some insight into how to actually roll the head. Which bit of the head that you hung on to? Mm, so stick to your finger in their ear and you're trying to pull it backwards. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not bad. <laughs> any any other silly suggestions? <laughs> on a on a more serious note, <laughs> I I have pulled on people's earlobes. I've never stuck my finger in their ear though. That'd be interesting. <laughs> But you know, if you, if you do want to experiment, now's the time. No, but really, now is the time. And um, you know, um, why not? If it's a, if it's okay, so if it's if it's a lesson, um, just need to pull it back a little bit. So that now we're getting into uh, now we're getting into the particulars of people's requests. Um, one of those case studies in there is of a woman who's lost her sight. Yeah, she's gone fuzzy. Everything's gone fuzzy. She's only seeing shades and shapes and colors. She's not seeing any detail. So in, in reference to that, 
we do have these paired organs, the eyes and the ears, that um, depending on where the sound or the light is coming from, especially the sound, we will try to turn ourselves until the source of the sound equalizes to both ears. Because if, if I'm here and the sound's coming from there, the sound gets to this ear first and this ear second. Right? So there's a slight time delay. So we, we're, we know or we learn to orient ourselves until the sound comes equally to both ears. Yeah? So if this turning lesson was about auditory pickup, orienting better, I've lost my sight, now I need to really do this orienting much better and far more securely, sticking your finger in their ear and turning their head from their ear would kind of make sense, wouldn't it? Because you're, it's no longer vision, you're going so it's it's ear based so you know those variations that we did well is it is it the ears or is it the eyes this is ears so yeah stick your finger in their ear and go tingalingaloo <laughs> sorry no, i'm not really sorry i rather enjoyed it so then the specifics of what you do arise out of the context in which it's done. For who and for what purpose. Does that make sense? So that's part of your answer. Yeah. Where do you mobilize them from? I've seen Feldenkrais do weird and wonderful things with the nostrils. Yeah. Maybe not the first lesson. <laughs> maybe have a disinfectant off to the side afterwards that would be good because I don't see him disinfecting his hands afterwards but anyway that's another story um, once again you have this beautiful organ at the end of your arm and what's beautiful about it is that it, it can conform to so many different shapes yeah, we can so it can conform to here, it can conform to there, it can conform to the under the cheek. Experiment, find out. Uh, for whatever you intent that you have, and you notice the intents are pretty primitive. In, uh, by primitive, I don't mean bad, I just mean basic. The intents are pretty primitive, roll the head backwards, return. So, you know, what kind of, uh, kind of handholds, what kind of hand-to-head interface enabled you to most clearly enact your intent in a way